pleasure to introduce the next speaker for the session of statistics and data analysis. Uh, the next speaker is Gabor Lugosi. He's from the Department of Economics in Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. And he will speak on mean estimation in high dimension. Uh, welcome, Gabor, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Nancy. And uh, let me say that this is, it's a great honor and uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I would have much preferred to be in St. Petersburg. It's a real shame that it couldn't happen. So uh, <clears throat> today I will, uh, I will uh, summarize uh, some of uh, my work that is all joined with uh, Shahar Mendelssohn. Um, on uh, mean estimation, and I will uh, follow on, on the high dimensional, uh, high dimensional setting. And um, mean estimation is really the, the simplest possible statistical problem that you can uh, probably imagine. And uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, I can convince you that, that there are some really exciting mathematical problems that uh, arise and that we still don't understand fully um, the intricacies of, of, of this uh, seemingly simple uh, statistical exercise. So as I said, everything I will say is joint work with Shahar and here's uh, Shahar when he's uh, smiling. All right, so <clears throat> even though the, the, the talk is, uh, uh, is in high dimension, I, I, will, uh, I will start with, uh, with uh, describing the problem in, uh, in, in the simplest one dimensional setting and, uh, and, and uh, that will prepare the ground for for the more interesting uh, multi-dimensional uh, problem. So <clears throat> the, the mean estimation problem in, in, in its simple, simplest uh, variant is when we have independent identically distributed random variables, in this case, real valued, um, and we observe those. And we would like to uh, estimate the mean that will be denoted by mu, which is just the expected value of, uh, <clears throat> the common expected value of these random variables. So what's an estimator? An estimator is just any function of the data, okay? So we allow any measurable functions. Of course, uh, if you want to estimate the, uh, the mean, the, the, the natural choice that's been used uh, forever is the empirical mean. We just uh, sum these random variables and divide by the sample size, and that's mu and bar. And, uh, and this makes sense because of, uh, because of the, the well-known low of large numbers that says that this will converge to the expectation no matter uh, what the underlying distribution is. So as, as the sample size goes to infinity, uh, this will be a consistent estimator of the, of the mean. And uh, if we don't, uh, if you're not willing to assume anything else about the distribution apart from the finiteness of the, of the expectation, then th basically this is the best we can say. So the, this convergence can be arbitrarily slow, no matter what estimator uh, you, you come up with. So if, in order to make the, uh, the problem a little more interesting, we, we need to assume something else apart from the existence of the, uh, of the expectation. And uh, in this talk, I will, uh, I will assume that the variance exists, but I, I'm uh, reluctant to go beyond that. Okay? So the variance exists in, in, in many interesting cases, but this is in, it's not a very stringent assumption. Okay? So if the variance exists, then the, uh, then the empirical mean, of course, this is statistics 101, uh, has, uh, has a mean squared error, which equals this, the, the variance squared divided by, by the sample size. And, uh, and it follows from, uh, from classical results of uh, statistics, the Raoul Blackwell theorem, that uh, you cannot do anything better than this. If, uh, if, you, if you want uh, the, the estimator to work, work well for a class of distributions that contains the, the Gaussian distribution. Okay, so the Gaussians are, uh, are, are somehow uh, a natural class of distributions and then we would like an estimator that at least works well uh, in those cases. So even if you know that the distribution is Gaussian, you cannot beat uh, this, this uh, sigma squared divided by n uh, mean squared error. And indeed, the, the, most of the uh, classical uh, literature and statistics focused on uh, risk measures, expected risk measures of this type, like the, the, the mean squared error. However, in, in modern applications in, in machine learning and, uh, and, and other uh, statistics uh, applications, we are more interested in, uh, in, in uh, performance that holds with high probability uh, rather than in expectation. And, uh, and that changes the, the situation dramatically. So all of a sudden, the mean squared error, sorry, the, the, the empirical mean is not such a good estimator. 
So this is uh, the, the way we formulate the, the, the question. Given a, a number delta, which is the probability of error that we, uh, that we allow, we would like to find what is the smallest uh, accuracy epsilon that one can achieve uh, with probability at least one minus delta. So we would like to find the smallest epsilon such that we, there exists a, uh, an estimator such that the error is uh, less than that epsilon with probability greater than one minus delta. And we would like this to hold for all distributions with a finite variance. Of course, we can take the, if we take the, uh, the, the empirical mean, then, uh, then uh, we can use Chebyshev's inequality and then we can take this epsilon to be sigma over uh, square root of n times delta. Okay, but this is not the best one can do. Um, and the, the central limit theorem gives us some intuition. So already for the uh, for the, the mean squared error, sorry for the uh, empirical mean, uh, if the sample size goes to uh, infinity, then the, the 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 distribution appropriately normalized uh, becomes Gaussian. And in particular, the central limit theorem uh, implies that as n goes to infinity, the probability that the error is greater than something like sigma times square root of log one over delta over n is small. So notice uh, that uh, the dependence on delta in Chebyshev's inequality was much, much exponentially worse than what the central limit theorem suggests. Of course, the central limit theorem is, is an asymptotic quantity, so we, we cannot do better than, uh, we, we, we cannot hope to have this for, um, for, uh, for any finite sample size, unless we assume other uh, uh, assumptions about the distribution. For example, if the distribution is sub-Gaussian in the sense that the, the moment generating function is bounded by the moment generating function of a Gaussian random variable, then simple Chernoff bounds uh, show us that, that this inequality actually holds uh, non-asymptotically. So it is true that, uh, that if, if the distribution is sub-Gaussian, then the sample mean <coughs> satisfies uh, a bound that is sigma times square root of log one over delta divided by n, exactly just what the uh, central limit theorem suggests. But of course, this assumption on the uh, on the uh, uh, moment generating function is is extremely stringent. This uh, implies that the tails uh, of the distribution decrease faster than the uh, than the Gaussian uh, than the Gaussian tails, which is of course. Uh, in many cases is, is, is way too optimistic to assume. Um, so if you are not willing to assume this, then the empirical mean uh, cannot hold this. In fact, it's, it's easy to construct examples to show that Chebyshev's inequality is, is sharp, that we cannot do better than what Chebyshev's inequality <clears throat> suggests. However, it is quite perhaps surprising that there exist estimators other than the empirical mean that satisfies this sub Gaussian, these kind of sub Gaussian bounds in a non asymptotic way uh, for all possible distributions whose variance is finite. Okay, and this has been well understood. Uh, these ideas uh, go back to, uh, to Nemir Nemirovsky Yudin, also Jerome Valiant and Vazirani, Alan Matthias at Segedi. They all came up with, with this kind of um, idea, which is the, uh, the median of means idea. Um, it's, it's an estimator that is uh, robust to heavy tails um, and it has a sub-Gaussian performance. So, so what does this estimator do? We simply divide our sample into K blocks, each of them of size M. Okay, so we, we divide the, the, the sample into a blocks of equal, roughly, uh, roughly equal size, uh, take the empirical mean in each block and then compute the median of these empirical means. So this is the median of means estimator. And then it's an easy exercise to prove <clears throat> that if we choose uh, the number of blocks appropriately, if we choose it something like uh, the logarithm of one over delta, uh, <clears throat> then uh, this estimator has this sub-Gaussian performance. So with probability at least one minus delta, the error is bounded by a constant which is, I'm not going to uh, worry too much about in this talk, a constant times sigma times square root of log one over delta over n, exactly uh, the, the type of bounded central limit theorem suggested. Okay, but this time it's non-asymptotic. Okay, the proof of this 
It's just a combination of, uh, of Chebyshev's inequality within each block and the simple simpler churn of bound to, to bound the deviations of the median. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the median of means also works uh, when the variance is not uh, finite. Uh, this is just a side remark. In my talk, I will uh, mostly focus on, on the situations when, uh, when the second moment of distributions exists. But if it doesn't, but some other moment exists, some moment of order, let's say one plus epsilon, one plus alpha for some number alpha, then, uh, then, uh, then the median of means has this property now that the rate of convergence deteriorates a little bit if alpha is, alpha is uh, less, than, uh, less than one. And this is uh, actually optimal. One can uh, show a lower bound that no estimator can perform better than, uh, than this type of bound for, for the class of distributions whose one plus alpha's moment is, is finite. Okay, so this also suggests, this lower bound shows that if alpha is one, uh, is equals one, which means that the variance exists, then the best one, we, one can hope is, uh, is a sub-Gaussian kind of bound. So you, we, one cannot beat the sub-Gaussian bound, no matter what, um, no matter what the, uh, what clever estimator one, one, one comes up with. And the median of means estimator achieves this bound. Okay. So let me just say that uh, that all of these uh, we, we wrote a survey paper. Uh, you can find all the, the proofs and all and, the, and the many other details in it uh, that, that I'm of course skipping now. All right. <clears throat> Another idea, which is a very natural idea that, that uh, every practitioner would use when uh, when facing a danger of, of possibly heavy tails, is the so-called trimmed mean estimator. Uh, this goes way back, even the theoretical study goes back to the 60s. So what one do, does in, uh, in the trimmed mean estimator is, is simply trim the largest and smallest values of the, of the data, to just throw them out in the garbage and trick the empirical mean of the rest. Okay, so this simple heuristic actually turns out to be the right thing if, um, if, uh, if the, the number of samples that, that one trims off is appropriately chosen. So if it's, if it's about log one over delta, remember delta is the, the probability of error that we allow. Uh, so if you trim off one over delta uh, values, then uh, this estimator also has a, a, a sub-Gaussian performance. And this was proved uh, recently by, by Roberto Inguseiro Oliveira and Paulo Orenstein. Okay. So uh, here in this talk, uh, we, uh, I will focus on a slightly uh, different, a modified version of the, of the trim mean estimator, which uh, is essentially equivalent to it, but, uh, but it, it turns out to be a little bit more convenient to work with. So here <clears throat> we divide our data randomly into two halves. Uh, I denote one half by X, X is the other by, by Ys. And, um, and we use the Y values to find the epsilon n and the one minus epsilon n quantize of the, uh, of, of the data. Uh, I define these quantized by, I, I call them alpha and beta. And now uh, we, we trim in, in, the, in the X sample, we trim everything down to, 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 to beta and up to alpha, that they fall outside of this interval and now take the average of these, these, these uh, clip values. So here's a picture. So these are our data points. We randomly color them into uh, well, reds and, and greens. So the reds are the, the, the Y values, the, the, the greens are the Xs. So alpha and beta are the epsilon and quantize. So I guess here I choose uh, epsilon n equals three. So these are the two quantize. And now we, we, we take this clip identity function, that's this uh, phi function and, and compute uh, pl plug the green points into this function and take the, the, the average. So that just means that we, we, we pull the green points that are below alpha or above beta down to beta here and up to alpha here and, uh, and take the empirical mean. So one can prove that this uh, trim uh, mean estimator <clears throat> also has a sub-Gaussian performance, just like uh, for we, we saw one for the, the median of means estimator. Okay. All right, uh, 
So let me just uh, mention a few papers that deal with this one, one dimensional problem. Uh, Catoni was probably the first one who drew uh, attention to, to, to this really interesting problem. He introduced a family of other types of estimators, uh, certain M estimators that I didn't mention. And, uh, and here I, uh, I listed a, a few recent papers that uh, that come up with uh, with, with different uh, estimators with, with often with the right constant uh, in the sub gaussian bound that that uh, that one wishes okay all right so this takes me to the uh, to the main uh, topic of this talk which is uh, how to estimate the mean of a random vector okay so now we move from r1 to rd and uh, and imagine that d is large but that's when uh, this problem becomes relevant though the way we discuss it. <clears throat> so X is now a random vector taking values in RD. Uh, uh, mu is now in RD. And, uh, and we still assume that the second moment exists, uh, meaning that the covariance matrix, uh, which I will denote by sigma, uh, is, is finite, okay? And the, the mean estimation problem is exactly the same as before. We, we have now, uh, we observe independent identically distributed uh, samples distributed according to this distribution and we would like to estimate mu okay and again any measurable function of the data is allowed as an estimate and we would like to have a sub gaussian performance just like in the one dimensional case okay but what is sub gaussian in in, in the multi dimensional case so so let's uh, inspect what happens if, uh, if the data actually happens to be Gaussian. So if the data uh, are Gaussian, then, uh, then the best thing one can do is, is the empirical mean, okay? And the empirical mean in, in, uh, in that case uh, satisfies this type of bound. So with probability at least one minus delta, the, uh, the Euclidean distance of uh, the estimator to the, the unknown uh, mean vector is bounded by the sum of two terms. This first term we call we call it the strong term. The second term we call it the weak term. So the strong term is uh, is independent of delta, and it's uh, it's the square root of the trace of the covariance matrix divided by n, and uh, and the weak term depends on delta in in the correct way, square root of log one over delta, and it's multiplied by the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. So notice that, uh, that uh, if delta is not too small, then, uh, then this first term will dominate since, uh, since the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. And here we only have one eigenvalue, which is the, the largest. Okay? And then this is uh, very easy to see by noticing that uh, if you take the, the uh, mu and hat, the mu and uh, bar to be the, uh, the empirical mean, then, uh, then the empirical mean itself is a Gaussian vector. And, uh, and then we, we can very easily bound the expected, va expected value of the, um, of, of the L1 distance because uh, we just use uh, Cauchy-Schwarz uh, and, uh, and, and the second moment can be computed uh, exactly. And <clears throat> one can use uh, the, uh, the Gaussian concentration inequality to, to bound deviations of the, um, of the uh, of, of the norm from its expected value, since uh, this norm is, is a Lipschitz function and Lipschitz functions of Gaussians are, are concentrated. Okay, so that's where uh, this comes from. So, <clears throat> so this is what we call now a sub Gaussian performance, right? Uh, so inspired from the Gaussian example, this is what, what our goal is. So the question is, uh, do there exist estimators such that for all distributions, with a finite covariance matrix, uh, the, uh, the uh, with, with probability at least one minus delta, the Euclidean distance of this estimator from the mean is bounded by some universal constant times the sum of these two terms that depend on the trace and the and so the the and the spectral norm and the Frobenius norm of the um, of the uh, uh, of the covariance matrix. Okay. So I emphasize that this constant C should be a universal a numerical constant. It should not depend on the dimension or on the distribution. Okay. So this is, this is our goal. <clears throat> and, um, 
and natural ideals uh, are estimate uh, are extending, for example, the median of means um, median of means uh, technique from uh, from the one dimensional case. Um, but for in in high dimensions, the the notion of the median is not so uh, is not so obvious. So there are many uh, ways of uh, of uh, of defining the median in a in a high dimensional setting. For example, one can take the coordinate wise median. One can take the uh, the geometric median, which is defined like this. Uh, these are all uh, generalizations of the one one dimensional median. Uh, one can take the two key median, and so on and so on. So there are many many notions. And uh, but but these notions are do not quite work. If you we use the median of means technique with uh, with this uh, with, with these notions of, of of the median, for example, if you use uh, uh, the coordinate wise median, then we get some we get a bound where the dimension appears only logarithmically, but still it appears explicitly. Whereas uh, whereas in the sub Gaussian uh, formulation, the dimension only appears. Uh, implicitly through the trace of the covariance matrix, and uh, and more crucially, th th there's no weak and strong term, but here the the trace is multiplied by log one over w. Okay. Um, if one uses the uh, the uh, the geometric median uh, for in the in the median of means uh, uh, in the median of means technique. Then, uh, then one can prove a, a better bound where where the dimension is uh, does not appear implicitly. However, um, however, still this is not quite sub Gaussian because the because log the uh, the the term that depends on the uh, on on the confidence delta is multiplied by the trace and it's not it should be multiplied by. By lambda. So this was proved by Minsker, and this estimator had been also studied by Xu and Sabato before. Okay. Uh, let me just say that uh, that uh, a, a very nice property of this uh, estimator is that uh, it is computationally easy, right? Because this involves the solution of a of a convex optimization problem, and in fact, um, it can be computed in almost linear time. So this is a computationally uh, Feasible estimator, which is uh, which is really a, an important issue. It is dimension free, but it's still not uh, quite sub Gaussian. So um, Shahar and I proved in this paper in uh, in uh, 2019. It was published in 2019 that indeed there exist uh, multivariate mean ex estimators that do have the uh, the sub Gaussian performance. Um, with the under the only assumption that the covariance matrix exists, and uh, we did this uh, by some an estimator that we call the median of means tournament. So let me um, let me describe it very quickly what the, what the, this estimator does. So the idea <clears throat> behind this estimator is that the mean vector is nothing but the minimizer of this function. Okay, so the the, the uh, the mu is the value that minimizes uh, this function f, the expected distance squared from uh, from uh, from from that point of of the, uh, of, of the of a random variable. And now what we can what we can try to do is that for e any two candidate values, for any values a and b in uh, in R D, we can use the median of means estimator to guess whether a is a better candidate for th than than b. Okay. Right, so so we can we can compute the median of means estimator of f of a. We can compute the median of means estimator of f of b, and decide based on that. Okay, so this and this is how we set up a tournament. Okay, so the, this kind of tournament-based uh, statistical procedures have a long history. Uh, they actually, uh, an example is uh, Birger's work from uh, from the eighties, <clears throat> where he used it in a in a different context. So <clears throat> so this estimator. Is equivalent uh, is equivalent to taking the uh, uh, take, taking uh, again dividing the data into blocks uh, blocks of size n there are k of them and uh, and now for each pair of points a and b we say that a defeats b if the majority of the points of these y of, of these block means are closer to a than to b. So for for any uh, for any uh, point A, 
we can draw, uh, we can determine the set of all those points that are look better than A. Okay, and uh, that is that is a bounded set for each for each point A. And now we can uh, we can minimize the diameter or the radius of uh, of the set for all candidate points A, and that is our estimator. Okay, and so here's a little picture to show that, for example, this point A defeats this point B because if we if we if we look at if we draw the uh, the, uh, the the bisector between A and B, then there are six blue points, six uh, block means closer to A, and only five that are closer to B. And this example also shows that this is a this is non-transitive relationship. This uh, A defeats B. Okay, so so we choose the, the point uh, such that the the uh, the points that defeat that point are is the, the set of points that defeat the, that point is smallest in terms of this radius. Okay, so that is our estimator. Now, of course, you you see that from the definition of the, the this estimator that the computation is is really non-trivial. Uh, one can prove easily that this is a measurable function, but uh, computation of it is, is, is at least exponential in the dimension if you, if you do it in a, in a naive way. However, uh, uh, Sam Hopkins showed that a version of this estimator can actually be computed in polynomial time. He came up with, a, with a, some kind of semi-definite relaxation of this estimator and showed that it can be uh, computed in time polynomial in the sample size and the dimension. And uh, this bound has been uh, improved by, by uh, different uh, estimators by, by these authors that I listed. Okay, so this is the median of means tournament estimator. One can also define another type of estimator based on the trimmed mean, uh, the, the trimmed mean uh, estimator that I, uh, that I described in the, in the first half of the talk. So here again, we color the points our data points uh, into into greens and and uh, and reds. So we at random. So we divide our data into into two halves at random, and we will again use the, the second half only to determine quantiles. But now for each direction in the in this d-dimensional uh, d-dimensional sphere uh, space. So for for each uh, unit vector in our d, uh, we. Uh, we we, uh, we we look at in, the, in that direction, project all points to that direction, and then we can compute the empirical quantiles based on the green points. Okay, Be sorry, based on the red points, the y, the y's. Okay, so now in each direction we have an estimator. We we have a trimmed mean estimator. This is exactly the same estimator that I uh, that I defined in in one dimension. And, and now what we can do is that in each direction, we, we, we now have an estimator and we just take a slab. Now we know that the, that the true mean should be in a slab, okay? And this, this slab is now, the, the width of the slab is a parameter. So, so this estimator uh, has this parameter uh, Q uh, where, uh, where we, we also slightly enlarge uh, the, uh, the, the interval around the, these empirical quantiles a little bit by, by this amount. And the width of this, uh, of this slab is also proportional to, to this parameter Q. And now we take, uh, for, for, for a given value of Q, we do this in all possible directions for all uh, vectors in, in the unit sphere. We, we take the one dimensional estimator, take the slab around it, and now we take the intersection of all these, okay? And finally, we, we, co we compute this for all possible values of Q in this, in this geometric grid, okay? And take the smallest one for which this set, the intersection of these slabs is, is not empty, okay? And then in, in that set, we can take a, an arbitrary point. That's our estimate, okay? So it's a little bit complicated, uh, the definition. This is, a, this is how uh, it kind of looks like. So again, uh, we use the red points. Let's say we, here it's illustrated in these two directions, U and V. So V is, uh, is this horizontal direction. So we, we uh, project all points to this horizontal line. We compute alpha and, and beta in, 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 in this dimension. 
we compute the, 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 the trim mean estimator, that's this U, and then we take this slab, okay? And then we take the, we do the same in all possible directions. So this is the same in this other direction. So this is the intersection of these two slabs, but we do it in all, all directions, okay? So that's the, the, the trim mean estimator. And the, the main technical result is that if, if this parameter Q is chosen in a correct way, depending on the di uh, direction, then, uh, depending on the on the distribution, then uh, then the the intersection of these slabs actually contains the mean with probability at least one minus q, and then uh, uh, and, and then uh, by 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 choosing uh, the value of q by by uh, by uh, in this way that I described by 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 taking the smallest possible value that uh, for which the uh, the these sets are, uh, the intersection of these sets is, is not empty, guarantees that we indeed have this sub Gaussian performance. Okay, so that's, that's another way of, of defining uh, the, uh, uh, an estimator that has the, uh, the, the sub Gaussian property. Okay. Let me just very quickly mention that, uh, that we also studied the problem when, uh, when the error is, uh, is measured by a norm that is not the Euclidean norm, by, by some arbitrary norm. So if, if you are given some norm uh, and, uh, and, and, and the confidence parameter, can we find an estimator um, that has the best possible accuracy uh, with respect to this norm, with probably at least one minus that. Okay, so what's the best? Again, we can see what happens for, for Gaussian distributions or sub Gaussian distributions, and if use if one uses the empirical mean, <clears throat> and then it turns out that that the, the what what can what one can reasonably expect is again an accuracy that's a sum of a strong term and a weak term. A strong term is some kind of an expected Radomacher average, so these sigmas are just randomizing plus minus one independent uh, symmetric uh, random variables. So, so you take the expected value of the norm of this uh, Radomacher average, and the weak term depends on this analog of the of the largest eigenvalue. Okay, so in fact, if if uh, if we take the Euclidean norm, then then the weak and the strong term are exactly what uh, what we saw before: the square root of the trace of the covariance matrix divided by n, and here the spectrum. Okay, and uh, and and we showed that in fact. Uh, one can what one can use a, a variant of the the trim mean uh, multivariate trim mean estimator that in fact achieves this um, uh, optimal uh, optimal um, bound uh, for all distributions with a finite covariance matrix, okay. and uh, and and the fact that this this bound is actually optimal has been shown in a in in a recent paper by Petersen and Lequi. Okay, uh, so let me, uh, in, the, in the remaining few minutes, I would like to, uh, to, uh, to describe uh, our, our uh, latest paper on, on this topic in which, uh, in which we look at a, a different way of measuring accuracy. Okay, so, in, so far we looked at the, either the Euclidean distance or some other fixed distance that depends on, the, that depends on, uh, on, on a norm that's given uh, in advance. However, uh, if you write uh, if you write down what the the sub Gaussian performance, then uh, then if you write down what what the Euclidean distance is, then uh, then we, we see that what what we what we showed so far is that there exists an estimator, or there exist estimators uh, that have the property that the probability one minus delta the uh, the inner product of the, the error vector and a direction u is bounded by the sum of these two terms. Okay. So in each direction, uh, the, the, the error in that direction is bounded by the sum of these two terms. However, we know from the first uh, part of the talk that in, in any fixed direction, we, we can do better. We, what, what we expect if we, uh, if we, we just uh, project our data into a fixed di direction, then the, the, the best bound uh, is proportional to the variance of the data in that direction. So the sigma squared of u is just the variance of the data in the direction of, uh, of this vector. So the question is, 
can we get something here on the right hand side that uh, that is that where where instead of the worst direction lambda one is is just the the, the supremum of all these type variances can we replace this lambda one by sigma squared of okay. are there estimators that are able to do this right so um so in in high dimensions we cannot expect that the that the data will be isotropic so typical, typical situations, there will be directions where the variance is really small. And, and in those directions, we would like to have a better guarantee that somehow depends on the direction of the. So instead of uh, looking at distance in the Euclidean norm, we would like to measure distance in the norm that is, uh, that is induced by the, by the actual covariance matrix. Okay. So of course, we cannot just have this, uh, this optimal bound in each direction without any penalty. There is a, a global penalty that, that, that one has to pay for, and that is easily seen by considering just an isotropic multivariate Gaussian, where we do need this strong term, where, which, which is global, and the, there's, the, the, that term is inevitable. Okay, so what is the best achievable global penalty? Well, again, in order to, to understand what the, what the best reasonable goal is, we, we, we can inspect what happens in the, in the case of Gaussian distributions when, uh, when one uses the empirical mean. Okay? So in that case, uh, <clears throat> we, can, we can ask ourselves the question is that suppose that I would like uh, to have a bound that has the, the correct form in each direction plus a global penalty, plus this strong term. Okay. So what is the smallest such strong term that one can get? And by, by studying the, uh, the, the Gaussians, it's, it's not difficult to see that this S, this strong term, has to be at least something like the square root of the trace of the covariance matrix divided by N. But in fact, we don't need to sum all the eigenvalues, but we only need to sum the eigenvalues uh, after uh, we, 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 can, we can drop the first log one over epsilon eigenvalues, the, the, the largest log one over epsilon eigenvalues, and we only have to sum the rest. So this is the best one can hope for, for a Gaussian distribution. And indeed for Gaussians, the empirical mean achieves this bound. okay? So now the question becomes, can we do something like this in, uh, for non-Gaussian distributions? Can this be done for all distributions uh, with a second one, with a finite second one. We don't know the answer to that question. However, we know uh, what, what, what we know is that, um, is that under a, a little bit more uh, than, than second moment assumptions, uh, one, can, one can achieve this kind of bound. Okay? So what is, uh, what is the assumption that we need? Well, we need some kind of a, a moment that is uh, slightly larger than the second moment. In fact, any uh, any two plus epsilon's moment would, uh, would suffice. Uh, but what we need is that in each direction, this qth moment is equivalent to the second moment in that direction. Okay, so the the, the qth moment of the of the distribution in any fixed direction is bounded by a constant times the second moment in that direction. And this constant should not depend on the distribution. It should not depend on the dimension. This should be a, a numerical constant. Okay, so <clears throat> under this assumption, we can prove the existence of an estimator that does have this uh, kind of optimal direction dependent uh, accuracy, uh, meaning that with probability at least one minus epsilon, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the error in any direction, u, for, this is true for all uh, vector, for all unit vectors in the sphere, the, the error is bounded by the sum of uh, these two terms. So, so the, the first term is, the, is the, the optimal weak term, which is which we would need even if we had a one-dimensional problem, and uh, the global strong penalty term that is, uh, that is the sum of the, uh, of the uh, eigenvalues starting from about log one over delta, which is uh, kind of the optimal uh, strong term that one can hope for. Now, uh, since I'm uh, running out of time, I will not uh, spend time on explaining what uh, the, the estimator looks like. And of course, I, I cannot talk about the proof. Um, the est let me just say that the estimator is, is, uh, is a combination of, uh, of uh, is a version of the trimmed mean 
estimator where in each possible direction we need to you know to, com to compute uh, uh, the trimmed mean and also we need to somehow estimate uh, uh, the uh, the variances in, in all directions and that is why we need this extra assumption that that one one can do that so uh, let me um, skip this <clears throat> um, and of course, uh, this is way too optimistic to prepare slides about, uh, about the proofs. Um, let me just uh, finish uh, the talk by a, by a few uh, questions. Um, so <clears throat> the, uh, an obvious qu question is that, is it possible to avoid this moment equivalence condition? So is it possible to, 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 to have an estimator that has this optimal direction dependent uh, uh, performance uh, without assuming more than a second moment? Uh, I don't know the, uh, the answer. We, we, we use this uh, moment equivalence in a, in a very essential way. And uh, it is quite possible that, uh, that it's actually uh, uh, not possible to, that there do not exist such estimate. Um, this multivariate trimming estimator and all of its versions are not computationally efficient. So it would be really uh, interesting and important to, uh, to find estimators that have a similar good performance without, uh, but, but, but that, that can be computed in polynomial time, at least uh, in, in the data and in the dimension. One can also ask if, uh, if this form of, of strong and, and uh, these, uh, this type of um, bounds that, uh, that, that, we, that we study, uh, that just the sum of a, of a strong and a, and a weak term. If we do not insist on those, can one do better? Okay, so um, you see in, the, in, in some directions, for example, it could be that if, if the data are, are concentrated on a, on a, on a, on a, on a smaller dimensional uh, plane, then in some directions, the, the uh, so the, uh, the variance is zero and we still pay a, a penalty term uh, in those directions in, in the current formulation. So this would be interesting to see that if, e if even the, uh, the uh, what can one do if even the, uh, the, the strong term is allowed to depend on the, on the, uh, on the direction. And, and finally, this is a, a huge uh, open area actually. One can uh, ask if, uh, what, how much of this can be extended to, uh, to general metric spaces where, where one can define the mean uh, as, as the fresh mean. And uh, th there is a nice uh, recent work by uh, Ho Yun and Bian Park who studied this, the median of means tournaments that I, that I mentioned at the week. So I think my time is up. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabor, for a very nice and very clear presentation and uh, to show us that uh, there is still lots of things to be done in the mean estimation in high dimension. Thank you very much. Uh, you. It's a fact that we do not have time for questions or because of the circumstances. And I know that you will be answering them by email or anyone that contacts you. Of course. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And um, see you in the next talk. See you. Bye-bye. Okay.